Hello, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ali Hassan. I'm an international TV presenter and journalist, and I have the great pleasure and privilege uh, to moderate this upcoming session, which is uh, promising to be a very interesting and uh, timely one because we have none other than the European Commissioner for Justice with us, Didier Reinders. Lovely to have you with us, Pleasure. Commissioner. Um, we've been talking a lot about democracy in the previous uh, 24 hours, uh, privacy, human rights, values, all these labels that have been going around and been mentioned throughout the sessions here on this stage. But there are some worrisome tendencies. Uh, as a matter of fact, the National Endowment for Democracy is saying democratic countries are more susceptible to authoritarian tendencies today than at any other time in the post-Cold War era. Troubling and, and worrisome is that Europe, which for many years, if not decades, have been a bulwark of democracy, is not exempt from that. Uh, quite on the contrary, we have some countries like Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, even Austria these days, where you are seeing some authoritarian tendencies. As the European Commissioner for Justice, how concerned are you? But we try to uh, deliver at the EU level about that, and so we try to be sure that it's possible to continue to organize a world-based system. And if you want to do that, you need to pay attention to the rule of law, uh, to the democratic process, and to the uh, human rights. And of course, um, we try to do the job at home in the EU, first to protect the EU, but also to be credible outside. And when you spoke about some member states, uh, what we try to do is first of all to engage a dialogue with the member states. So for the first time last year, we have published a rule of law report on the 27 member states. And I must say that we have received many positive reactions to improve the situation in the different member states. But sometimes you have a more systemic issue and you have mentioned some member states and there we need to use other tools and in brief we have one the possibility to go to the court of justice the highest court in, in europe to ask to take a decision and to impone uh, some uh, evolutions in different member states and it's the case and we have received positive reaction of the court of justice in the last months but if it's not enough uh, we try also to make a link between the funding on different policies and the protection of the rule of law. If there are some breaches to the rule of law, it's possible to suspend or to stop some uh, funding. To give an example, uh, in the last years, we have seen uh, some attacks against the uh, LGBTIQ community. And so we have suspended some funding and we continue to do that with a success because there are some way back in different member states and we'll continue. And now we have a huge mechanism since the beginning of this year. It's a so-called conditionality. That means that if we have a real breach to the rule of law in one member state, it will be possible to suspend or to sp stop all the different fundings, not specific fundings, but uh, the MFF and all the, the recovery and resilience facility. And we have seen maybe, to conclude on this, in the last days about the recovery and resilience plan that we have forward to start the recovery in Europe, we have discussions about that. If it's impossible to see reforms about the independence and the quality of the justice system or about the fight against corruption, it's possible to don't deliver, to don't fund the recovery uh, and the resilience plan in some member states. And to give example, you have mentioned Poland and Hungary. We are still in discussion now about that because we have put some uh, country-specific recommendations in our analysis of the budget in the so-called European semester in Europe. And we make a link. If it's impossible to implement reforms in relation with that, we don't want to uh, fund uh, new developments in those countries. And you've already mentioned some of uh, the measurements that uh, are in your toolbox, if yeah. you will, as European Commissioner. There are some politicians, some European politicians, uh, however, who say after the European Commission has released its latest annual rule and law report that the, the report is toothless because at the end of the day there is an absence of recommendation against violators. There is an absence of, of actual based, uh, real life based tools that you can take against these countries. I, I, I take it you disagree. Yes, I disagree because the conclusions of the two first reports in September last year and July this year were very clear. And is the reason why you have seen maybe uh, concrete reforms in Italy. They are voting now uh, reforms in the justice system on the basis of our conclusions. But to be clearer, we have decided to come next year with 
real recommendations, very concrete recommendations. It was said by the President of the Commission in uh, her speech in, before the Open Parliament, uh, because it will be maybe uh, simple to say we recommend something and then the follow-up will be maybe more evident. But again, uh, to don't have any um, doubts about that, in a very large majority of member states, uh, the report coming from the Commission, it's a, an important tool to start discussions about reforms. It's a real pressure because there is a real intention to improve the rule of law. But in some, it's not enough and we need to use other tools, like I said, the Court of Justice or uh, the, the funding, the discussion about the funding. And we have the same discussions with the Council of Europe or with the World Bank uh, when we are looking to uh, the candidate countries because we will ask to the candidate country before the accession to the European Union to fulfill all the criteria about the rule of law, human rights and democracy, but also with the neighboring countries and in the dialogue with all the partners, also with Africa. We have started a new partnership with Africa and I have asked to put the same approach on the rule of law in that, mm -hmm. in the partnership. Interestingly enough, it was only three decades, only 30 years ago, that Francis Fukuyama wrote The End of History, uh, implying that liberal democracy is going to triumph. Uh, uh, he mentioned Europe, of course, as one of those places that will lead the way. Now we have countries, again, without trying to single out anyone, we have countries that are deeply undermining the ind independent judiciary, that are undermining freedom of press, sexual orientations, all these things on a daily basis in the heart of Europe. You, you are a very experienced politician. You've been around for a long time. You, you were a Belgian minister for 20 years. What's the word that, of your sentiments? Are you surprised, shocked, dismayed, disappointed at the events that have unfolded in the previous years? Well, sometimes disappointed about the uh, evolution and certainly the determination to undermine the justice system, to be concrete. But I'm not so surprised because during many years, uh, we have paid attention in Europe uh, to the budgetary situation, the economic convergence, the social convergence, but not so much about the values. To be concrete, uh, after the accession to the European Union, it was said it's done. You are fulfilling all the political criteria, so it's not the need to verify that. Since some years, maybe from 2016, we have started, I was in the Council at that time, and we have started to discuss about a possible verification of uh, the values and the respect for the values like we have about the budgetary situation and we have enhanced the uh, control on the budget since the bank crisis and the sovereign debt crisis 10 years ago. Now maybe with the evolution in, in some member states to an authoritarian regime, we are paying more attention also to the values and that is very new. But I said it's not only uh, to pay attention to that in the EU but it's also to be more credible when we discuss with the others. And we want to have our common standards in Europe, sharing the same values, but we try also to have an influence on the rest of the world. I will just give you some examples. Uh, I have just listened to the previous discussions about health. When you try to protect the privacy, to protect the personal data, you need to put into place a regulation. In Europe, it's the GDPR. And we have seen since some years, three years now, after the implementation, that there are privacy laws or same kind of regulations in many parts of the world, not only in California or in South Korea, but also in Kenya. And so more and more, we are moving to a standardization on the basis of the same values with some like-minded partners. The same about the consumers. I'm in charge of the consumer protection. Of course, we need to protect the safety of the product and to, to give safe products to the consumer is the reason why we are engaging with a dialogue with China about that. Uh, you know that 70% of the unsafe products in the European market are coming from abroad and not from uh, European companies. But we need also to protect the data of the consumers when they are more and more shopping online. And you know that with the pandemic is the case. And then we try also to put into place new regulation about the protection of the environment fight against climate change or protection of biodiversity or the protection of human rights in the way to organize the corporate governance in the companies. I will come in the next weeks with a proposal about the sustainable corporate governance. That means the obligation to put into place a due diligence process on the own operations of the company but also the supply chain uh, to, to verify the, neg the possible negative impacts on the environment, on the human rights. Give an example, we have 
listened many comments about China in the last days, but we want to fight against forced labor. It's very clear, and we want to ban the introduction of the open market of products with false labor in include. And so that means that when you speak about rule of law, fundamental rights, it's important to deliver at home in the European Union and to take care in different fields of that to be able to try to have an influence with like-minded partners uh, on the standardization at the global level. And that's very important. The GDPR was a good example. I'm hoping that in the uh, sustainable governance we'll have the same uh, uh, impact like we have had with the Paris Agreement on the climate. Indeed, and you have mentioned that uh, the credibility of the European Union is very much uh, uh, impotent and, 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 and at stake for what you are trying to do. How often does it uh, happen when you go around the world and you talk to other ministers, commissioners, and uh, trying to point out their, for lack of a better term, deficiencies in democracy and human rights, and they're telling us, why don't you get your own house in order first? How often does that happen? No, but first of all, we explained that now we are monitoring the situation in all the member states, mm -hmm. but if it's needed, we are taking actions. Uh, to be concrete, you spoke about independence of the justice system. I have asked to the Commission to go to the Court of Justice to impose daily financial sanctions against Poland, to be very concrete, uh, concerning the independence of the justice system. But it's not just to talk about that, it's to take concrete actions. And we try to uh, ask to, to do the same uh, in other parts of Europe, maybe, with, I said, the candidate countries or Eastern Partnership, but also in the world. I have had many discussions with the, uh, the World Bank about that, and we try also to make a link between the funding of different policies and at least the respect for human rights and fundamental rights of the, of the citizens. Of course, we have like-minded partners, and it's maybe easier to discuss with them, but also there we need to have uh, very strong discussions, because just two remarks. First, if we want to be strong, we need to deliver at home, but we need to have more and more a so-called uh, strategic autonomy. We need to be able to manage ourselves in some fields uh, or development. During the pandemic, it was very clear about vaccination, uh, we are the first continent now to provide vaccines in the rest of the world and we have a real capacity in the vaccination uh, process. But we have uh, had discussions in the last hours about AUKUS and different evolution in security field. We need to continue to invest in our own security to be more autonomous and to be able to have a real discussion in an alliance with some partners on an equal footing. And when we discuss about data protection, to go back to our uh, first issue, uh, of course we have the GDPR, but we want to see if it's possible uh, for the protection to fly over with the data. When you travel uh, with the data to the US, you need to be sure that the protection is traveling too. And now I'm in discussion with our US colleagues about the successor of the so-called privacy shield, so how it will be possible to organize traveling of data to the US, like we have organized with Japan or with South Korea, with the same protection of the personal data. Of course, they are industrial data. It will be there in contrary, better to exchange and to open uh, the access for startup researchers and developers. But your personal data is very important. And to be concrete, what I've seen, I've seen in Europe, in some member states, but also in the world, it's a real conflict between some goals. Sometimes I have listened to the comments saying, of course, it's important, the privacy, the protection of personal data, but we have a security issue. So we need to have an access, we need to have a retention of data. Or it's important to have an economic development. So you need to protect the data, but we need to exchange and we need to use. Yes, but if your personal data, you need to protect it. And we have listened just now about health is the same. You want to be sure that there is a protection of your personal data, but there are many actors asking to have an access. And it's the reason why you have maybe on your, uh, in your pocket your smartphone, we have organized just before the summer the digital COVID certificate. I was in the parliament and the council to have an agreement on a new legislation in two months' time. It's very short at the EU level, but with a first condition, a limited number of data. We don't need to know if you are sick or not with another disease. We need to know if you are vaccinated, if you have a test, or if you have a recovery from the disease. No more than that. No information about your blood or about other kinds of issues. So that's also very important. And now we are in discussion with many partners 
to see if it's possible to implement the same system with the same protection. Uh, you mentioned the procedures that the European Union has started against some member states, uh, including Hungary and uh, Poland, of course. Uh, some of these countries in exchange and return are, at least on, on, uh, on a verbal note, are threatening to leave the European Union. They're saying, listen, if you push us too hard, uh, if you push us to take European law over our national law, there might be consequences. We've all, the European Union has already lost Great Britain. How concerned are you and how delicate is the issue for you as Commissioner for Justice to strike the right balance between uh, ensuring that values, human rights and the rule of law is being guaranteed without expelling or losing other members? But there are in fact two elements in discussion with some countries. That, the first one. So, what's the answer? Of course, it's possible to disagree with the European Commission. It's a political body. So, if you put into place a legislation in one member state, we are sure that maybe it's a discrimination or it's a breach to the rule of law, to independence of the justice system, but it's possible to explain no. Uh, we are with other goals. But if we disagree, we have the possibility to go to the Court of Justice. And when you have a decision of the Court of Justice, it's become to be a binding decision. And so we try to explain to all those member states that they have signed a treaty, with an Article 2 in the treaty, uh, explaining the values. And we are sharing the same values. And so we have a charter for fundamental rights, we have different laws. And if at the end it's possible to have a binding decision of the Court of Justice, you need to apply. So that's the first answer. So, of course, we may disagree, but not against, like in the US, when you have a decision of the Supreme Court, like at the national level. And now we need to push pressure on different member states to, to maintain such a principle, because there is a risk of spillover effect from one country to another one, maybe from Germany in some case to others. If we are challenging the decision of the Court of Justice, it's all high jurisdiction. If you disagree with European law, you don't need to attack the uh, High uh, Court of Justice. You need to change the law. Mm -hmm. uh, to give an example, we have many debates about migration. We have put on the table a new migration pact. Change the law, but don't attack the authority of the Court of Justice. And the other comments that I've listened in many uh, discussions with some member states is, yes, but we are elected. So they are explaining that democracy is the only one answer. And if you are elected, you form a government, and so you may change the rules. No, there are some limits. That's the rule of law. And uh, I'm coming from a country where sometimes it's very difficult to form a government. It's not the only one now. There are others in Europe. But also, if you are able to form a government with only one party, there are some limits in your possible actions. And the limits are in your own constitution, but also in the uh, EU treaties and maybe in international rules in relation with what? Again, rule of law, democracy and uh, uh, fundamental rights. And we don't ask to have the same system everywhere. You know that we have 27 different electoral systems. It's very difficult to understand the system in my country, in your country too, but we will have the only one presidential election in France <laughs> next year, the real presidential election. So we have different systems but we are quite sure that they are democratic. And it's the same for the justice system, uh, for other kinds of elements. We ask not to be similar, so I fully understand the, the comments about the different culture, different history, but we need to be in compliance with the values, and that's the main issue. And if we are doing that at home, again, it's possible to discuss with other partners and to try to form a group of uh, partners at the international level to go in the same direction. Of course, it's easier with some than with others. And I want to repeat that with many difficulties that we have had maybe with the US in the last weeks and months, we are allies, we are like-minded, we are sharing the same values, that we try to convince them to work together at the international level. It's maybe f more difficult with some others. And the development that we are seeing on a global scale, namely that democratic countries are more and more susceptible to authoritarian tendencies. Take the US uh, storming of the Capitol uh, in America. You had a presidential um, 
uh, you had a president rather who didn't acknowledge the results of the election. I mean, these are setting bad examples, of course, for the rest of the world. So it's becoming yeah. more, it's becoming probably more difficult to, to set the example and, and to insist on democratic values and human rights of all across the globe with examples like these, no? Of course, it's the reason why the new president, uh, Joe Biden, decided to try to organize a summit about democracy uh, due to the events in Capitol Hill. But it's not only uh, the challenge for the internal democracy in one uh, country. It's also the fact that it was combined with uh, bilateral actions and no more multilateral actions. And if I'm looking to the difference between uh, the previous administration and the new one, we have seen in the last days that there are some common approach on some specific issues in the world. But the main difference is maybe a real new willingness to take part in multilateral discussions. We will see, we will verify, of course, if it's the reality. But to be able again uh, to take part in multilateral discussions with a real uh, capacity uh, to defend our positions as Europeans, we need to be strong in Europe. Again, about democracy, human rights, fundamental rights. But we need also to build more and more our own strategic autonomy. That doesn't mean that we want to be against others, but we want to be sure that we are discussing on an equal footing with different partners. And is the case in health policy. You know that I've seen that in the Commission, we didn't have any competence in health system. Uh, it's not a real competence at the uh, EU level, it's a national competence. But we have built a new policy day after day due to the pandemic. And now there is a common agreement in the Member States that we need to have a European policy in health. I'm hoping that it will be the same about security and defence, about the control of the external borders and about different kind of issues. If we are not doing that, we'll have more turbulences in the EU and we will lose our credibility in the discussions with the others. So it's not against other partners, but we need to have an autonomic, uh, a strategic autonomy in the EU and we need to deliver, to do the job at home. I try to do that about democracy, human rights, and um, also in the electoral debates in many member states, it's important to pay attention to the declarations and to try to repeat that we need to work together with some principles. And I said the principles are the primacy of the EU law when the European Union is competent, but also the fact that if you have a high jurisdiction like the European Court of Justice, you need to apply the binding decisions of such a Court of Justice like the highest court in, in a, a country in a national, uh, at the national level. And with 27 member states as the EU Commissioner for Justice, it cannot be easy by any stretch uh, of the imagine. I can imagine getting everyone on board. As a matter of fact, if we look around the world, if we, st if we uh, put on some, some global glasses uh, and, and look beyond, we, you see different alternative models throughout the world. As a matter of fact, yesterday during dinner, we had President Kagame uh, from Rwanda. Some might argue it's an imperfect democracy but it's a functional system. You have other parts of the world where you have the same. Is democracy the be and end all it, it used to be, at least on, on paper, or um, is that a slippery slope if we say, well, look, uh, there's an argument to be made, democracy versus efficiency. Um, sometimes in order to be efficient to get things done, maybe you have to compromise on some democratic uh, elements. Well, what is your take? My, my first priority is uh, I will say the rule of law, so the fact that we want to work with a rule-based system and to be sure that there are some rules. Of course, we promote democracy, it's clear, but we promote more than democracy, maybe human rights. And it's very important in all kind of system that we have maybe in the world to be able to discuss with the leaders about the human rights and the protection of the women. Because it's not due to the fact that you don't have a democratic system that it's possible to organize violations of all the human rights. Of course, it's maybe a tendency if you don't have a democratic system, but I don't want to make a, a separation, but it's very important to continue to discuss about human rights, dignity of uh, the individuals, also when you discuss with country without a real democratic uh, system. And that's very important at the worldwide level. And I will say, in the last discussions that we have had with the African Union, it was one of the components to say it's not to come with lessons to give. It's maybe to share a common value, uh, the full respect for human beings. And is it possible to say you have different systems, maybe, 
but you need to pay attention to that. And uh, uh, just to give a last example, you know that at the uh, European level, but more the EU, we have had the Istanbul Convention. Istanbul Convention uh, to do a lot of things, and I fully understand that it's possible to have a different conception of the family, and we have in Europe different conception of the family. But violence against women or children is a crime. And so if you don't want to ratify the Istanbul Convention, we have said at the EU level, we will organize our own process about the crimes against women and children. And that it's possible to explain also in many countries in the world where they don't have a democracy, but it's not because you don't have a democracy that it's normal to have violences against women or children. So some, some uh, elements and some rights are not to be negotiated, you say, they are fixed and ought to be respected and upheld. Uh